Luke chapter 6 is where we'll be at this morning, verses 46 through 49, sermon titled, Caution Construction Ahead. You know, when we moved here several years ago now, there was a day that we were driving along 136 and saw something seemingly so bizarre and random. We saw someone riding a horse on the side of the road. Random, because like, this is South Florida. You don't really expect to see horses being ridden on the side of the road in the middle of South Florida, and yet here they were. And so we continued driving along the road to even see that there were stables tucked away and a training course where they were training these horses. And I remember driving by and seeing one trainer who was struggling to rein in his horse. Horses being the wild animals that they are, need to be trained to obey every command in order for them to be safe to ride and to use. So that if you go into any dangerous situation, that the horse will obey instantly. And you get to a horse to this point of obedience, I'm going to speak outside of my area of authority, so I consulted a, a professing horse expert this week. His name is Chris Portal. So if it's wrong, this is his fault. But according to when you're training these horses, it takes a period of time to build up this sort of obedience in a horse. It's generally referred to as a breaking point. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer, where you're generally training and teaching this horse to obey its trainer consistently. So if you go, go right, it goes right. If you want to nudge it, go left, stop, move forward. But you see, this breaking point is where the horse consciously chooses to submit to the rider in any situation. And it, sometimes this breaking point happens over a period of even months, maybe even a year. But as you see the horse soften to the instruction of its trainer, it's shown and indicated by obedience to the trainer. To where the horse will eventually obey for the rest of its life. But the only way that you know that a horse is willing to follow your lead is if they obey the commands of the rider. There's no other way to know this. And you know, there are so many similarities when we come to the Christian life. When we come to Christ, we too have this sort of breaking point where we have to consciously choose to surrender to Christ, to repent of sin, to trust in Him alone for salvation, and then seek to live in active obedience to Him each and every day. This breaking point too can be but a moment, or it can take weeks, months, even years to be informed by the Scriptures, soften to obey and submit to Christ. Because as we saw last week, a genuine believer will respond in repentance and faith to the message of salvation, and this repentance will produce fruit in their life, and this fruit will be in accordance to obedience, as we'll see this morning. Because more than anything else, the telltale sign for a follower of Christ is that they obey Him. This is the distinguishing marker of a true follower of Christ, a true believer, as opposed to those who I refer to as make-believers, who might be deceived or pretending or faking it. Because the truth is, if you don't obey His words, you're not truly following Him. You're likely following yourself. Just like a horse, if it's not submitting to its rider, is not following its commands. But the truth is, there's, there's many who profess to follow Christ, but instead of actively obeying Him, they simply passively listen to him. They might be interested in spiritual things, interested in the Bible, interested in Christianity, but they're mildly interested in what he has to say, but there's no lasting fruit in their life, no application, no obedience whatsoever. And Jesus is going to reveal that this morning. He's going to show us the importance of obedience for those who claim to follow him. For obedience is the true test of whether we belong to him or not. Not simply responding to him, in his message of salvation with some sort of positive affirmation, but it must be responded with positive action through obedience. So we'll find ourselves in Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49, where Jesus is going to call for a response of obedience to his message. Now he's going to officially conclude his sermon that we've been walking through progressively over the past several weeks. And as he concludes his sermon, he's going to provide two clarifications about your response to his message. The first we'll find in verse 46, the reality of your response. Verse 46, he says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? You see, we have to remember that Jesus drew 
hundreds and thousands at the time to hear him teach. These massive crowds pressed in on him to hear of this new teaching, to also be cured of their ailments, their illnesses, their diseases, and their afflictions. And so he attracted these large crowds who wanted to associate with him to receive the benefits of being around Jesus, to be healed and to learn. But Jesus knew their hearts. And he knew that many of them were mere professors of the faith, not possessors of faith. And so he's going to give them a sort of reality check regarding their response to his divine message so far. He knew that many would profess with their lips to follow him. They, they liked to be around him in his teaching and his presence. Yet the response of their hearts was not of obedience to him and his message, but of obedience to themselves and their own hearts and their own flesh. And this has been an issue with all of God's people ever since the beginning in Adam and Eve. In fact, Ezekiel records this in chapter 33, verse 31. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. And you see, there is a great deception which comes to those who simply hear that thinking that some mere intellectual knowledge of God is enough, that that knowledge in itself is what saves. But if you're professing to be a follower of Christ and yet you lack a commitment to follow Him in active obedience in every aspect of your life, it could be that you are deceived to where James 1.22 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So James is alluding to an aspect of professing to have faith, but not actually applying it in active obedience to where you could be deceived. And deception is something that's vitally important to the Bible and vitally important to God because we live in a world where Satan is actively trying to deceive people away from the true gospel. And there are many who think that they are professed to follow Christ in obedience, yet they, they aren't. So how does someone come to this perspective of being deceived? What is that exactly is it that lulls someone into deception? Because Jesus is alluding to that in verse 46, that there is a crowd around him, people who associate with him, they claim to be his followers, yet they're deceived. Well, I believe there's four reasons primarily why people are lulled into deception. The first, I think, is a false doctrine of assurance what you're basing your assurance on. You see, this can easily come with the best of intentions as we receive assurance of salvation for other people and other individuals. Well, you raised your hand, you prayed a prayer, you walked an aisle, or even with the best of intentions you've assured or somebody's assured you in a moment of doubt, no, you must be saved. Clearly, you're a Christian. There's no other way which, as an aside, is why we're so cautious at this church to baptize children and young people, because we know that there is much time that's needed to, to show the fruits of repentance over the course of the years. And we want to be most cautious and discerning as we approach this. And even when we baptize someone, it's based on their profession of faith as they identify with Christ. But a false doctrine of assurance is just one. I think another one is a failure to examine yourself a failure for self-examination. Jesus has been teaching this over the past several verses. He's told us to examine ourselves, removing the plank that's in your own eye, to look at the fruit which has been produced in your life. Is it a fruit that accords to godliness and righteousness and fruits of the Spirit, or is it fruits of the flesh and fruits of sinfulness? And now he's calling us to see how we respond to his message. Because self-examination looks at the heart and its desires and its motivations and what we are producing and what it accords to what nature. We saw this last week. There's a third aspect which contributes to deception, a focus primarily on religious activity alone. And the parallel account of our text in Matthew indicates that Jesus' audience here found their confidence in what they did, not what he was doing. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you who practice lawlessness. You see, Jesus' audience were trusting more in what they did than what Jesus would do for them. They were deceived because they were only looking to their activity level. Now, these must have been people that were doing so much. They were likely involved in every vacation Bible school there. They were likely regular churchgoers. They even gave of their monies and offerings, and they might have even been so godly and spiritual to go on a mission trip. But remember, our confidence for salvation is not in what we do, but what Jesus has done on our account. And so while the fruits of salvation will be evidence in good works, we don't place our confidence in the good works to receive eternal life. We trust in Christ by faith alone, not in ourselves. So it's not as simple as balancing out the scales or doing more good than bad or evil. No, we actually need perfect righteousness. We need a perfect scale, and only Jesus can supply that. One final one. What else contributes to deception? a false understanding of the gospel. You know, there's more and more of a widespread belief in our world amongst modern Christianity, but also other religions as well, that as long as you have faith, whatever it may be in, that that faith is what's important. That if you have sincere faith in something, someone, some being, some deity, that you will arrive at the afterlife that you so desire in the end. But the issue that the Bible teaches clearly is not the sincerity of your faith, but the object of which your faith is in. Because you can have the most sincerity of your faith in anything else, but if your faith is not in Christ, you're sincerely wrong and deceived. And all of these roads lead to self-deception to where you could say, Lord, Lord, but actually not belong to Him. might be thinking you're okay when you're actually not. Because James 2 tells us that even the demons have a, a baseline belief and knowledge of God. James 2.19 says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So there, there must be more than just an intellectual knowledge of who God is. We have to know the truth of who God is, what sin is, what we've done against God, and what Christ has done to save us from it. We must know that, but we must also affirm that, and we must move beyond those two things that separate those who are unsaved from those who are saved. We must place our full confidence and trust in what Christ did. And this sort of true conversion is demonstrated with fruits of obedience in your life. Because Jesus is teaching here in verse 46 that kingdom admission is not based on a simple profession, but a life that demonstrates a possession of faith, which manifests itself, it reveals itself in walking, active obedience to Him on a regular basis. He, doesn't, he says, don't, don't call me Lord with your lips if your heart does not acknowledge and submit to me as Lord. Because the title of Lord given to Christ, it means the one who is most sovereign, the one who's most authoritative, the one who is over all, which is why Paul in Philippians 2 tells us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is who? Lord. So he says, don't, don't, don't call me this title which says that I'm the sovereign one in your life when you're acting like you're the sovereign one. And that's how you live. One writer said it this way, which was helpful. Let it be a fixed principle in our religion that obedience is the only sound evidence of saving faith and that the talk of the lips is worse than useless if it's not accompanied by sanctification of the life. The man in his heart, the Holy Ghost really dwells, will never be content to sit still and do nothing to show his love to Christ. For if we truly love Christ, we will want to serve him with our lives. We will want to demonstrate that love and desire through ongoing, regular, simple, boring obedience. So this is the first clarification that Jesus gives at the end of his message, calling for a response, giving them a reality check about their response to his message. Where are they truly at? But now he's going to give a second clarification explaining the ramifications of their response. What happens if they don't respond appropriately? Well, that's what he addresses in verses 47 through 49, the ramifications 
of your response. Verse 47, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. We saw last week Jesus use an example of agriculture, that of growing and plants and produce. Now he he switches gears and uses an example of architecture, something we're familiar with. And the principle is very simple. If you hear what Jesus is teaching and you respond in affirmation and obedience to it, it's like you're digging deep and laying the deepest foundation so that when the storms of life come, you don't go anywhere. But if you simply respond to Jesus' teaching as you're just interested in what he has to say, but that's for him, that's his beliefs, you've got your own, you're, you're laying this foundation on the surface to where it'll be wiped away. Perhaps this is the, a good example of this in South Florida is when you dig fence posts for your house. If you've seen someone dig a fence post or you had to replace the posts at your house, you know that digging in South Florida is not fun, to put it nicely and kindly. And so it's tempting to just dig a couple of inches into that soft soil before you get to the rocks, the roots, and all of that other stuff. But you see, what happens if you dig just a few inches down, clear it out, put the post down, maybe like you cover it up and like pat it down really good, maybe even step on it, and then you walk away? What happens when the winds start to pick up during hurricane season? Where's that post going? It's gone. Which is why the recommendation when you dig posts according to the internet is to go down two feet. Two feet's a long way when you're digging in South Florida. You gotta use machinery that could easily hurt you or someone else. Like it's dangerous, you're cutting through rocks, roots, and everything else. But you know what happens when you put that post two feet deep and surround it with concrete? Where is that post going when the winds pick up? Right where you left it. It's going nowhere because it's been laid on a solid foundation with depth there. The greater the depth comes the stronger foundation and greater stability. And so when it comes to digging deeper here in the foundations of the Christian life, Jesus wants us to understand that our digging is never done. In fact, if we look at verses 47 and 48, he uses the word come and building. These are both indicated in the present tense, meaning that they're ongoing, continuous actions for all of our lives. We're never stop finished digging deep into the scriptures. We're never stop digging deeper into who Christ is. We're never stop drawing closer to him as the fountain of all resources for life. We're never done growing stronger and more mature in the faith and in Christ as we accord to knowledge of God's word and obedience to it. Because the more we dig deep into the scriptures and the more we actually apply it in obedience, which is what Jesus is calling for here, the stronger and more mature you will be in him. Meaning the more stable, rooted, and grounded in the truth you will be when the storms of life come, whether persecution or trials or anything of that regard. You're stable, immovable, persevering. But the opposite's true as well. You could take the easy route. Just come and listen. Just hear what Jesus has to say. But if you only listen and not do what he says, you're building on the shallowest of foundations where there's no depth to hold you down under any regard until the storms come. And in fact, there's even implications here of final judgment warnings because whenever in the New Testament you see the word flood appearing, if you read the context, it should really pique your interest and point you back to the flood of judgment in Genesis 6 with Noah. Because if you aren't heeding Jesus' message regarding salvation by faith alone in Christ alone, then the flood of God's wrath is on you and you will not escape. John 3.36 teaches this with clarity. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. 
mentioned verses 47 and 48 of our text. The, these terms come in building or in present tense. But if you look at verse 49, he uses the word built, meaning a completed action. You see, if you respond to Jesus' message with rejection and you consciously choose to suppress it in unrighteousness, like Romans 1 says, and you reject it, what he's saying is it's already completed action. You've already lost before the judgments even come. If you decide to reject Jesus' message here in his teaching, you've already lost. It's what he's communicating here. The context of this illustration appears as though the both, both houses are, are built in the same region because it looks like the same storm affects both of them. The same river rising affects both. So it's not a matter, matter of geo, geography about where you're building the house. It's not even about the appearance of the house and what it looks like. It's about how it's constructed and what it's constructed on. Is it dug in the depths of the foundation that it'll hold, or is it standing on the surface where it will be wiped away? Because what Jesus is illustrating here is that those who have a depth of foundation in him, these are his obedient disciples, who not just come in here, but they go and do. They apply these things to their lives. But those who have a shallow foundation here, these are simply the passive listeners who come as one in the crowds wanting to associate with Jesus, but they walk away unrepentant. They walk away still being guided by their flesh, and they'll be wiped away. But it's much harder to be an obedient disciple because it takes more time. It takes more effort. It takes more energy than simply building on the surface and merely associating. Because as you build on the truth of the word, as you build on Christ, it requires much time drawing near to him and studying the scriptures. It takes more energy engaging in the truth. It takes more effort to plow through your own pride and self-sufficiency of what we normally stand on and acknowledge and admit that we cannot stand on anyone or anything other than Christ himself. And it's tempting because while everyone looks the same on the outside, Time and truth will go hand in hand. Everyone will reveal what they're standing on when the storm comes. But when the storm comes, can you fix the foundation? No, at that point it's too late. Because it's difficult to determine the integrity of any sort of foundation until the storm comes. So Jesus is concerned here with how you will respond to his message. Not just his message here this morning, but the message of the gospel at large and the teachings of Scripture at large. Will you submit to him and submit to his word as the authority in your life? Will you cling to Christ for your salvation or will you still cling to yourself and your good works? I really have just two questions before we close this morning. Jesus has already given us the application to the sermon. It's to obey. We must obey Christ in every single area of our lives and seek to do so consistently. So there's two questions I want to leave us with before we close. The first is this. What foundation are you building on for eternal life? Are you building on Christ? Or are you building on some other false foundation? You might wonder, what does that mean? What is a false foundation? What can somebody think that they're standing on, but really they're not? Well, you can build on mere association. Well, your parents are believers. Or you go to church. Or you profess to be a Christian. You see, that of identifying with Christ through another thing or another person. You cannot just be building on association, but also building on appearances, focusing on the external to the expense of the internal, going through the motions and prioritizing actions, but never actually being transformed internally by the gospel. You can build on association, you can build on appearances, you could also build on false teaching, or build on human achievement, thinking that you can actually earn eternal life on your own. If you do more good than bad. But the truth is, there's only one person who's earned their way to heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. And the only way that you and I can get to be with him is by clinging to what he has already done. His obedience, 
his righteousness, repenting of your sin, that you have offended this holy God, and there is no hope for you outside of his son who took your place in his life, took his place in his death on the cross, taking your penalty, taking my penalty on himself to satisfy the wrath of Almighty God for all of eternity so you and I can draw near to him by faith alone. This is the only foundation which can be stood on. Any other foundation is a false foundation, meaning you won't stand, you'll fall. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3, 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Second question, what response will you have to Jesus' message? We saw last week that everyone will have a response. Everyone always has a response to divine truth. You either suppress it in righteous, unrighteousness or you submit to it in obedience and faith. So will you respond to this message in suppression and rejection or will you respond in acceptance and in obedience? Because it's not enough to simply come and hear. Jesus is not interested in having more in the crowds who come and hear. He's interested in those who will submit to him as disciples and then go and do to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus cares most about. In fact, Jesus would reject many of which you hold today thinking that any of the commands of Scripture are legalistic. But as Jesus has taught us this morning, striving for holiness, striving for sanctification, and obeying His commands is what He calls us to do. In fact, if we've seen anything today, the biblical Christianity which Jesus teaches Himself insists on obedience. Because we're only followers of Christ if we do what he says. Otherwise, we're just one in the crowd. We're just one who associates with Jesus but doesn't truly belong to him. So it's not enough to just come and hear. You must respond in repentance and faith and then ongoing obedience throughout your life. Because James teaches us that our hearing is only as good as it leads to our doing. He says this, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does." How is it that we can be blessed in what we do? By doing what he says. By obeying his commands when it's easy, but also when it's difficult. The one who obeys Christ will truly be blessed. And you know, it's when it comes to times like this that many think that the greatest obstacle to their spiritual growth is that they're missing some secret aspect of God's will. But more often than not, when people struggle with spiritual growth, it's not for a lack of information. It's for a lack of obedience to the information they already know. So Jesus is telling us here, you have all the information needed. You know that I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know that no one else can build on a foundation other than on me. And so it's not for a lack of information, it's for a lack of obedience ongoing that we think we know better than God does. And so we choose to sin, we choose to disobey, we choose to go the easy way of the flesh. And then it ends up in hurt. It ends up in hardship. It ends up in broken relationships and ramifications of heartache and hurt. And then we try to go back to the word and obey it at that point. But the damage has already been done. Instead, dear ones, if we simply... Go to the word first and simply apply it in obedience to each and every context of our life which it speaks. It'll lead to the blessings and fruits of righteousness. It'll lead to the blessings and fruits of the Spirit as we do this all by His grace, as the Spirit continues to work in us and through us. You know, the Christian life really isn't that complex. There's a lot in the Bible. There's a lot of deep depths of truth there. But what Christ calls us to do is very simple. 
I remember we were out at a friend's house in California, and their youngest daughter, they were teaching her and training her. She was a few years old. And she'd done something she's not supposed to do and, you know, struggling with a response as young ones do. So they called her over, and the dad said, Sweetheart, what's your job? And she responded, to obey. You see, for her, for a child in the home, the command for her is very simple. She needs to obey mom and dad as long as it aligns with the Bible. And you know that simplistic picture is so clear for you and I today. What's our job? It's to obey him. It's to obey him. It's to love him. It's to serve him. It's to do this from a heart, not of obligation, not out of duty, but out of delight in what he's already done for us. In the grace supplied through the Spirit of God and the teachings of the Word of God, if we simply stick to the Scriptures and seek to apply this daily and obey it, Psalm 1 says that we'll be like a tree planted by streams of water and will prosper in all that it does. But what often happens is that we often suffer more than we need to because we try to rely on our own understandings instead of going to the Scriptures and adhering to what God's Word says on a daily basis. Because Jesus says those who will sink or float away be consumed by the storms. It's not because they didn't know what to do. It's because they knew what to do but didn't do it. They didn't respond accordingly to his message. And with utter fascination, Jesus' sermon began the same way in which it ends, with a blessing to those who obey in righteousness and to woe of judgment to those who disobey in unrighteousness. The question is, how will we respond to his message? I've been praying this week and will continue to do so that we'll respond in obedience, seeking to build our homes, build our lives on the only foundation which will stand, that of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, it's in accordance with this truth that we pray that you would help us to apply it. Father, it's easy to hear this. It's simple to understand but it's so difficult at times to actually live out when we have our flesh fighting against us. We have Satan fighting against us. We have this world actively fighting against us. But Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us fighting for us in this fight of faith, that you've given us your word, you've given us your spirit, you've given us your church, to all lead us in the path of righteousness. So, Lord, I help, pray that you would help us this morning to simply obey what we know we should do. Please help us to believe the truth, not just factual knowledge, but deep, reverent trust which submits and obeys even when it's hardest. Lord, for those who choose to actively obey you this week, I pray that you would help them exponentially by your grace to bless them, to strengthen them, to encourage them, to help them as they seek to grow in the Christian life, as they seek to be conformed to your Son, as they seek to obey you as we're called to do. Pray that you would deal with each and every one of us according to where we're at. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.